Good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I'm Nancy Prafke, I'm the mayor of the city of Punta Gorda, and I wanna welcome you all to our uh, citywide master plan session this evening. And to those of you that may be watching this on uh, video, welcome to you all as well. We welcome everyone. And um, you know, this is a, a process that's so near and dear to us. Uh, we started this back in 2005 when we did the Citizens Master Plan, and that became a, a real piece of work that we, it, it really shaped our direction. And, and this is gonna help shape the direction of our community for, for years to come. And last week, our city council was at the Florida League of Cities, and we heard Major General McQueen, who is the city manager for Panama uh, City, talk about their recovery from Michael and in it, he showed all of the partners that they're using. And one of the partners that they're using to help them in their, their rebuilding of Panama City is Dover Coal. And when I actually mentioned that we, uh, to, to Victor, he said, well, we mentioned Punta Gorda to them. They've learned a lot from you. So we are leading the way. And that's one of the things that FEMA said is, you know, we, we've set a, a record on recovery. And when the community's involved, the recovery is so much faster. And it's what everybody wants. So I know that um, a number of us, I, I hope you've had the time to pour through the document. I've been reading it and scribbling on pages and, and, and whatever. Um, some of it is like, what? And some of it's like, oh, OK. So it's, you know, it's really a provocative kind of thing. But that's good, because it gets us thinking and it, it helps us uh, shape discussion. So I hope that you are as excited about being here this evening. I'm gonna turn this over to, to Victor. And uh, welcome again, and uh, let's continue on this path. Thanks. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor, thank you very much. And is this my cot, Aaron? All right. Uh, thank you very much for coming out tonight to look at the work. It's been a big journey to get to here. We're gonna show you uh, uh, piece by piece, the draft of the citywide master plan. Uh, then at the end, we'll get a chance to get, get some feedback from you, hear some new questions in preparation of the refinement of that draft, to get it ready to slide across the desks at your elected officials and say, okay, here it is. We've taken out the things that, that uh, needed to be removed. We've added in the things that need to be missing, that were missing, and uh, it's, it's ready for action. So think of it like that. This is the next step in a drafting process that you helped us uh, begin many months ago. That's the key word for tonight, <coughs> draft. Uh, we do now have more than a PowerPoint show. Back in, uh, in the earlier part of the year, in, the, in March, when we were gathered uh, to work on the in initial ideas and first sketches, I, I emphasized that word draft. At that time, we didn't have it boiled down into a document with a table of contents and a, a detailed list of recommended policy prescriptions. One of the comments at the time, and we've heard it a few times since, is uh, don't just share with us in headline form the big ideas, but give us the, the details. Put some policy meat on those bones. And so we have attempted to do just that. Uh, we're going to show you some of that up here on the big screen tonight. Uh, now, you may find, uh, as we show uh, excerpts from the book and, and zoom in on maps and, uh, and lists of things and what have you, that from the very back of the room, uh, some of that is too hard to read in detail. We're not actually expecting you to read every word on every slide here. This is being posted online, and so after tonight, you can go through and uh, in, in the close-up way on your own computer or your tablet, you can look at it in detail again, while hopefully you're also... Uh, reading through the draft book. But we, I will say, uh, for those who want to, there are still a lot of seats that are down close on this end of the room. So if you find it's easier, to, it'll be easier to see. Don't worry about uh, disruption. Just go ahead and uh, stand up, make your way down here, and sit where you can see a little bit closer. So uh, do me a favor. Just repeat after me one word, draft. Draft, OK. Which means there are some thought-provoking things in here. There are some big moves, some uh, bold uh, suggestions for what to do. 
Uh, they're not also bold. Many of the ideas are things that were in the 2005 master plan that just haven't been implemented yet, and they're brought forward in a new way or simplified or given more direction and detail so that in this next round of uh, building the city that you want, uh, they can be made real. Uh, so I don't think you'll be surprised by anything in this because all of the things we'll present tonight are discussions we had with community members uh, throughout the year, especially back in, uh, in January during the Journey to the Future, where we took a special emphasis on streets, and then in March in the community charrette. For uh, those who remember, it was a kind of a step-by-step -step process which began in December with a kickoff meeting. Then in January, we made a visit here and interviewed many folks uh, and, uh, from boards and committees and leadership positions and uh, partners of, and entities of influence over the future of the community. We did a lot of walking tours and photographs and asked a lot of questions, met with the staff to ask a lot of technical uh, inquiries. And then in March, in the beginning of March, we had a presentation to the city council of the initial budgetary and economic analysis findings. Mayor, one really big difference between the 2005 plan and, the, and this one is that uh, when you charged us with this, uh, your, you and the city council members and your city manager were emphatic that this one had to be based in the economic reality, implementable based on what was really going on here by the numbers. And so we have attempted to do just that. And every once in a while, as we show something in tonight's slides, Louisa or I will pause and say, we did it that way because of what the economist said or because of the fiscal implications for the sustainability of the city's budget, or because of the way the realities of real estate development work, or uh, what have you. So you will hear us keep coming back to that budgetary analysis. And then in uh, starting March 11th, we had a week-long community design charrette, which involved a hands-on session, uh, working around maps in small tables that uh, with several different seatings, uh, over at the church, a, a tremendous crowd, just out of curiosity, show of hands, how many of you present tonight were present for that March 11th kickoff and hands-on session? In, oh, that's perfect. Okay, terrific. Each of you who raised your hand are now officially deputized to explain what went on there to your neighbors. That's as much detail as I'll go into. But we believe that the best plan is made by many hands, and so we brought many hands together uh, and started the maps just that way. Then through the remainder of that week, we had an open design studio. We also uh, looked at specific uh, topics of interest uh, and current controversies, including Gilchrist Park. And at the end of the week, we, uh, we had a, a gathering again for a look at a work in progress presentation. This is my 32nd year doing this kind of work, and that was my first total blackout power failure during such a presentation. <laughs> So thank you all for not panicking and storming the exits and waiting until we got the lights on again uh, during that presentation. But we did make it through that. And from uh, that event, we produced a short report on what went on that week, what we thought we were finding. Then in June, uh, your city urban designer, Mitchell Austin, made a presentation of uh, initial findings and work in progress to get, as a check-in, to get feedback. Uh, he gave us point by point information about the conversation that went on that day and heavily influenced the document we've returned with now. So we're all the way to the rightmost box in this timeline, which is the public presentation of the draft master plan. We want to show you what's inside it. It's a, it's a book. Now, it'll, it's also easy to read uh, on your tablet or on your computer screen. Um, and you might find that actually useful because, you know, of course, you can zoom in and look at any of the pictures in greater detail um, or copy and paste the text that offends you most and email it to us with your comments. Uh, but we do want you to look at it. Uh, so although we're going to walk you through a kind of high-speed briefing on what's in it tonight, uh, we implore you to go online if you haven't already, uh, open the document, and go through it from front to back because this tool or some variation of it that gets finally adopted will be used in the coming decade to shape your town. It's just that important. Now in the beginning there's a table of contents and I just want to describe to you what's in that table of contents 
uh, because I realize it's a little small to read up on the screen. In the beginning, it's an introduction that describes the process I just recapped, the purpose of this plan, uh, and how to use this document. And then the second portion of it is a kind of x-ray of all the existing conditions, key findings, uh, for example, about the demographics or the, uh, the analysis maps that we did, the, the narrowing down of the key findings and issues are in that second section. Then there's a portion that includes a story about the history of this place for those who might start with this document. Uh, it tells the history of Punta Gorda through the lens of growth and change. Basically, since the beginning, growth and change have been constant in the story of the town. And I, looking back on it, I realized we put this here because we feel like what happens in the coming decade will be more change, and change can be unsettling. And of course, we all know change can either make things better or make things worse. The purpose of the plan? Getting growth and change that, make thing, that makes things better. Uh, and so it tells a story of that uh, and talks about the difference between change that helps and change that hurts and sets the stage for the policy prescriptions that follow. The fourth section of the book is about preserving community character. As Louisa will show you in a minute, one of the, the questions we asked through surveys and keypad polling uh, was about what matters most to you and what's the most important thing to you about the future of the town. <coughs> the number one answer, by a large margin, uh, was that what attracts people to this town is the community's historic character. And so in this section, there is a, a rundown of the strategies and tools you use to get more of what you do want and less of what you don't. This is where we introduce the idea that not everything has to change. While change is a backdrop and change is important, many things should stay the same, and most areas will be unaffected during the coming 10 years by, uh, by the prescriptions and illustrations and so on that are in this book. Uh, and that leaves us then with key areas, focus areas, uh, places where the in investments need to be prioritized. This is also the part where we run down the tools and strategies for historic preservation, recognizing that your historic preservation movement locally is moving into a new decade and, um, and will we'll probably be kicking into a newer, higher gear. Uh, than even in the past. The fifth, and I would argue most important chapter in the book is uh, arranged around the big ideas. Uh, there's this part, uh, there's the five main ideas, which I'll recap for you momentarily. Uh, it, uh, it will describe to you the uh, why each of the matters give you a central idea for each of them. Uh, and then we will illustrate those ideas in the focus area. So the, most of the presentation that Louise and I are going to do tonight will be on these big ideas and then how they are implemented in those areas for focused change. The last part of the book is about implementation. We're back where we started. You said base it in the fiscal realities and do a plan we can actually make happen. So the, there is a, in chart form at the very end of the book, there is a detailed step-by-step uh, -step set of prescriptions. It's organized by what you do in the short term, the near term, and the long term. And it's organized by what the project or activity is, who's responsible for carrying that out, and a recommendation for where to find the funding if it's an idea that requires uh, a cost. Now, in a couple of years, that will end up being more than just a prescription of what to do on a list. It will be a scorecard or a report card for how you're doing. Because you'll be able to go back and look at that and say, okay, yes, we've started this one and that one, but not this third one. And we, have, we need to pick up or arrange, rearrange the priorities and so on. So I hope you will use this tool at the end of the book, which will be the punchline in our presentation tonight. Louisa will uh, bring it up at the end. If you want to see what that looks like and how it works, stay with us for the next hour or so as we go through it. Now, uh, the, the five big ideas, I'll stop on this just to recap them for you, are pretty easy to remember. They're short, 
bumper sticker, sticker length ideas. The first one is make downtown a vibrant and attractive place. It is that in the, in the making, certainly. And there's been a lot of positive progress change uh, in the last 15 years. But downtown is the one thing that you all have in common. Whether you live in downtown or in the historic district, or you live on the edges of town, or you live in BSI or PGI or somewhere else, downtown belongs to everybody. What happens there affects everybody. So that's number one. Number two is about the water. And it says, celebrate Charlotte Harbor and welcome more boating. It identifies this place as a world destination for sailing, boating, fishing, and says, embrace that. That's an important part of who you are and suggests how to do so. The third one, third idea, is to diversify your housing. There are lots of underdeveloped or undeveloped places where you can do that. So it doesn't mean uh, undoing something that already exists necessarily. But as you fill in the lost space, to make a special effort to diversify your housing. In particular, to make it easier for the people who work here to live here instead of commuting very long distances from far away. The fourth of the big ideas is about transportation. In essence, it says, make Punta Gorda more of a walking town. Fully embrace walking and biking. That will be a, part of, a key part of your strategy for doing the things that are related to auto traffic, like managing your congestion, or improving safety. But it all centers around starting first with the idea that your streets must be walkable and then working out to deal with all of the other priorities that are imposed on your streets. Last of the five big ideas is to encourage strategic commercial development. To keep the taxes at the at their right level for the residents of this town, you need to make sure the tax base has a strong commercial component. Once again, there are good places to do that without having to disrupt something that you're used to. And we will walk through each of those again. If you uh, weren't writing all that down, you will see it again. Louisa? Thank you, Victor. So I'm going to start with some of our key findings. As Victor mentioned, what's different about this plan from the 2005 Citizens Master Plan is that we're really trying to look at feasibility, economic feasibility, budgetary impacts of the recommendations we're making. And so just, just by a show of hands, I was curious who in this room has actually seen the economic development and budgetary analysis that was completed as a part of this. <laughs> so it is not nearly as beautiful or exciting as the master plan, but it is equally important. Um, so for those of you that have the time, I would recommend it because so much of the findings from this, from the economists who are on our team and were together with us during the charrette, are what really informed a lot of the recommendations we're making in the plan. And this slide summarizes the highlights of those findings. For example, some of the housing issues we uncovered that Victor spoke to are there's a lot of workers who can't afford to live in town, and 22% of workers in Punta Gorda actually have to commute more than 25 miles to get here. Um, in terms of city budget, we learned that the budget reserves are low, and they're also uh, the revenues are really dependent on single-family residential property taxes. Uh, in fiscal impacts, we've learned that uh, the land uses constrain the potential revenues. So having more efficient uses of land will actually increase city, city revenues. We also looked at annexation. And what we found in studying different annexation areas, which you can read in um, great detail in the budgetary analysis, is that while we can increase revenues in certain areas, annexation areas, they also come at higher costs. So it's not the solution to everything. It's not necessarily a silver bullet. So those things all have implications for the master plan. So for housing, for example, uh, we are looking at developing a greater variety of housing types um, and also increasing the amount of, of density and the number of multifamily options that there are, particularly in the downtown. We also uh, recommend that placemaking be very 
very much highlighted in everything we do. Because investing in high quality urban design and places actually attracts a lot more visitors, it attracts more commercial development, it attracts tourists, and really kind of helps the entire town to blossom. And then from a regulatory landscape, we have to look at revising land development regulations and zoning to ensure better outcomes. So the good news um, is that, as Victor mentioned, the most important thing, um, the Punta Gorda's biggest strength that we learned is the quality of place and sense of community. And this is what we're really trying to highlight throughout the plan. And it speaks to what I mentioned about placemaking in the slide before. So the goal and what we're seeking to achieve with this plan is to find the right balance between vibrancy and growth to have a more sustainable economic future with the preservation of the character that everyone feels so strongly about, and rightly so, which is maintaining a small, quaint, charming town. Um, and this is basically the goal of, of everything we're doing, is to find that balance. And so one way to do that, as Victor mentioned, is to concentrate the areas of growth and change. So one of the first steps we did was to map all of the potential development sites in the entire city. Um, but this doesn't mean that all of these sites will get filled. So really, we wanted to focus in on five key, uh, not five, but a couple key areas. Um, and these are the areas you see in purple. So we're not looking at all of these areas for growth and change. We're really focusing in on these key areas, which are the downtown, east and south downtown, the area around Fisherman's Village, um, the areas around Tamiami and Shreve, uh, the small neighborhood centers in PGI and BSI, and the Jones Loop Road area. So growing from that idea, one of the very, very, very important maps that you'll see in the plan, it's called the Future Character Areas Map. This is the map you see above, above me. And what we did is we want to map out, based on what's already happening in the existing character of the area, what we want the character of this area to be moving on into the future. So this map has eight different areas, um, from the downtown to a downtown flex district, to a traditional neighborhood, to a neighborhood center, to a suburban area, and then to natural areas. So it breaks down all the characters of the different areas, and this is to help guide development in the future. And this actually serves as the first building block of what could become a form-based code as well. And what goes along with this map is this special page that you'll see in the plan. It's basically a table that highlights in great detail what each of these character areas should look and feel like, um, just from an aesthetic perspective, but also from a regulatory perspective. What are the kinds of developments and the intensity of development you'd expect from this transect of spaces, from the, from the less intense to the more intense in your downtown? So another map we created that goes hand in hand with this is an investment sectors map. So not only are we looking at the places where we want to encourage growth and change, but how do we prioritize those areas? So where are the areas that you really want to focus on your investment first? So the highest priority areas would be in the downtown area and around the downtown and the more traditional areas in, for infill development. So in the yellow, what you're seeing are stable neighborhoods. So these are the lower priorities. They're already built out. Their character is already what we'd expect and what we want to preserve. And then the last and very important way to preserve community character as, the, as there is growth and change is to make a concerted effort, as you have already done and should continue to do, to preserve historic assets. So we've actually gone in and mapped all the existing contributing structures also the murals that have been painted, as well as uh, historic buildings that have already been lost, lost to port maintenance, to hurricanes, um, because a lot of this has already been lost, and what we want to do in the future is just make sure that all the assets that are here are preserved. And so we have several strategies in the plan that speak directly to this. This is a recap of the list of big ideas that I walked through a few minutes ago. And I want you to see this again because the maps give you a hint that there's, and the sure thickness gives you another hint, but there's a lot of technicality in here. And these are a little bit more like the, the Bill of Rights for the, for the plan. This is the most important principle. Now, by the time you're done editing it, maybe we'll only have four, or you'll find a sixth one. But the, the idea um, 
we have for writing it this simply and showing it to you once again is that as the technicalities get sorted out and the, um, and the details get debated, when you're not sure what to do, go back to this list. This is where you go back and say, is the change we're thinking of making to the plan or to the land development regulation consistent with the vision in the, the citywide master plan or does it contravene that vision? This is the list you go back to and say, if we're furthering these goals, we're probably on the right track. We're going to start uh, with each of these and go, we'll, we'll start with number one. So as Victor mentioned, number one is to make downtown a vibrant and attractive place. So the central idea in this chapter and what we're presenting today is to fill in the missing gaps downtown to attract more residents and visitors and invest in street and public space improvements that increase safety and comfort for people of all ages and abilities walking, biking, and driving. So that's kind of our guiding principle. And at the beginning of each chapter of the big idea, or each section of the big ideas, we actually break down what are the big challenges related to this idea and what do we recommend as the key city investments and policies to address those challenges. So I don't expect you to read this, and just as an example for making downtown a vibrant and attractive place, um, one big challenge is the lack of housing and people living downtown. You know, for us to achieve this critical mask of a vibrant downtown, there needs to be more people living here, which will attract more businesses. Um, so one of the key city policies that can help address that is to revise your zoning and land use regulations to allow enough, enough intensity and predictability to get uh, residential and mixed-use developments built downtown. So we did a couple things to test uh, how downtown sites might get developed. Um, and we spoke to developers as we were here on the charrette to get their views and hear their perspectives of why some of these developments have not been filled in yet. And some of the challenges they spoke to us about was insufficient development potential that's permitted to result in viable projects and also some negative pushback. So these were the, the main things we heard. So we, we tested some scenarios, um, and I'll go through those quickly. And again, you can read much more detail about these in the plan. But we looked at two main options in City Marketplace, one that was um, lower intensity and a second one that was a slightly higher but allowed for community benefits, like a new public space or a town square. We also looked at a uh, mixed-use development in the USAVE lot. And we looked at an expansion at Fisherman's Village. And we tallied up the actual development potential on all those sites, and we put it in a table for comparison. Um, and one note I want to make about a lot of the images you're seeing is that while some developments um, happen all at once, a lot of the times these projects get phased over time. So we don't want you all to think that all of this would happen overnight, because realistically, it doesn't always happen that way. And there's some existing structures that you keep, and in time, will change. So these are um, sequences you may have seen already, so I'll go through them quickly, but just to show, for example, on USAVE, how it can start filling in uh, piece by piece, phase by phase. And the same can be said uh, at Fisherman's Village. Piece by piece, you can start at the waterfront. You can add uh, structured parking in, as you need to in time. And in the end, you can also add townhomes further back as you get towards Henry Street, for example. So lots of benefits of, of compact development. Uh, one big benefit is that it helps preserve your natural spaces. Um, it's also, by, by clustering uses together and people together, you're actually making a more efficient use of your city services and your city infrastructure as opposed to having to spread them out. And you also get to protect the areas that you don't want to see new development in, for example. And the plan goes into more detail about this as well. Another key thing to make a vibrant downtown is promoting arts and culture. And this is something we heard a lot while we were here on the charrette. Um, so just to call out one thing was the opportunity to partner with local arts organizations such as the Visual Arts Center and the newly formed Harborside Center for the Arts. And uh, there was one more thing that we tested on the City Marketplace site, and that was the option or the possibility of doing a community arts center as a part of that redevelopment. Um, so it could include uh, art spaces, ancillary uses to support a, a community arts center. Uh, it could include a, uh, a performing arts theater as well. Um, 
and this is also going on through a parallel process. They're studying different options, but we wanted to explore the possibility of, of what that could look like in City Marketplace. And so just to take you again um, through the different options, so it's clear in City Marketplace, we looked at a lower intensity option. Uh, we looked at a slightly higher intensity in exchange for some community benefits in public space. And I want you to notice also um, in those two slides what's happening along Taylor Street, and I'll show some images. That there's an idea to make Taylor Street um, from Marion to Harborside Avenue as a festival shared street. Um, so that it could be used almost as spillover space. You know, when there are events, you can close it to traffic and it becomes really a public space. So in this before and after, you can, you can take a look at how it's changed with trees. Um, it has special paving. Here, you can see it closed with um, street vendors on the street and tents for a special event. And here it is with the Performing Arts Center. And we wanted to show a ground level view of what that could look like as well. So here you are on Taylor and Marion Ave. Um, so here it is, existing condition. Here you can see it open to cars, as well as the new uh, public space, the town square. And here is what it could look like if it's open for a special event when you invite vendors to come and do a market, perhaps a Christmas market, spilling over uh, from the town square into the street as well. So another thing we looked at in terms of making a more vibrant downtown is how you design for attractive storefronts. And this goes back to preserving community character as well. You can adopt specific design guidelines um, to help ensure that any new development that has a ground floor that is active, which we would really want uh, in a downtown space, is designed in a way that's attractive, right? And our economists, again, recommended that an additional 20,000 to 25,000 square, square feet of well-designed downtown real, real retail space could really round out the existing offerings. And this is what we mean when we say, kind of get to a critical mass that would help attract more people. We also looked at what street design should be for a successful retail street. So one thing is the ground floor space of the building, and the other important piece is the street itself. So are there, is it comfortable to walk? Are there places to sit? Is there shade, especially as we all know today, uh, how hot it is outside. So particularly important here in Florida. We also looked at parking. So this is an interesting map we created. And so all of the bubbled in gray blue areas are existing surface parking. Um, and then the dark gray is the, is the structured parking lot. So it's, this, is, this is not uncommon to Punta Gorda. We see this in a lot of places where you have key downtown prime real estate um, that is being used for surface parking. And it goes back to what we mentioned in the key findings of, of the most efficient use of space in a city and what that means for your city revenues. So what we propose, oh, it, it, also in terms of your walking environment and making a vibrant downtown, would you rather be walking next to a parking lot or would you rather have a nice storefront with shade trees? So we looked at consolidating the parking in key locations. Um, and we also looked at different uh, parking management solutions, such as the shared valet program, time-limited parking, or even centralized shared parking, which is when developers, um, instead of providing on-site parking, can pay into a program that would then build structured parking. We also looked at public realm enhancements for the downtown. So some key things to mention from this map is um, these, I, this idea of gateways, a sense of arrival as you arrive into downtown Punta Gorda. And the two sites that we identified for that would be along Marion and Mila Street. That's the picture on the upper right. Also a new gateway and public space at the intersection of US 41 and Taylor. And this is something we actually recycled from the 2005 Citizens Master Plan. You can see those in more detail later on in the presentation. Um, also looking at filling in the gaps, like I mentioned, so here you see the USAFE site, um, as well as a shared street along Taylor. And here are some of the other sites that we recommend filling in. Um, another thing we mention in the plan is preserving green space where it counts. Um, people feel very passionate, and rightly so, about public green space here, especially along the waterfront. And it's something we mentioned in the plan, particularly in Gilchrist Park, to think about as uh, you're trying to balance parking needs with open green space, of finding a happy medium to keep as much 
public green space as possible. And so talking about Gilchrist Park, we have submitted uh, a first internal draft of this report and we are currently revising it. And we know everyone is very anxiously awaiting that to be released. So we wanted to mention it. That activity uh, feasibility analysis and report will be submitted, will be shared um, Wednesday, September 4th. So that is coming very, very soon. So I want to move to the second big idea, which is to celebrate Charlotte Harbor and welcome more boating. The central idea is to partner with waterfront property owners, yacht clubs, and local boating advocates to increase amenities for visiting and local boaters, protect the unique marine habitat of the harbor, and uphold Punta Gorda's reputation as a world-class sailing, boating, and fishing destination. And again, um, at the beginning of this big idea in the plan, we talk about the challenges and the key city investments and policies. So, for example, one of the big challenges is the lack of upland facilities, boat slips and day docks to accommodate demand. And so one of the key policies we recommend is partnering with the property owners such as Fisherman's Village and the Punta Gorda Waterfront Hotel and the Sheraton Four Points to expand their marinas and provide uh, upland facilities and additional day docks for visiting boaters. Um, so we have a, a map as well that we've produced that kind of locates where these different amenities should go. Um, where, from everything from kayak launches to upland facilities to expanded marinas. Um, and here are some of those, those key things that we recommended. I already mentioned working with Fisherman's Village, um, working with the different hotels as well. This is another idea that we shared that came from the Charette, and it was an idea to use big art on the bridges. Um, this is a way to celebrate the harbor. And a program like this doesn't have to be on all the time. Bridge lighting uh, today with modern LED lights can all be calibrated. It could be on for a couple of hours. And there should be some study to see how this might affect the marine life. But um, this is one way that during special events or certain hours, you can really highlight the harbor. And so this is an image we've showed before, uh, but just showing how some of these uh, private properties can help accommodate visiting boners by either reinstating a marina or adding a new marina or expanding an existing marina. So here's the before and the after. Um, and here again you see how as a part of new development you can also get um, additional boating amenities. The third big idea is to diversify housing types. The central idea of this is, to, um, is that new multifamily and compact residential development fills in the missing teeth around Punta Gorda, attracting young families and a wide variety of service workers and professionals, all while promoting walkability and bikeability. So I'm sure you're starting to pick up that a lot of these ideas cross over into each other. Um, this will cross over into walkability and bikeability, which we'll talk about next, um, just as the boating amenities also correlates with making a more vibrant downtown. So there's a lot of, of um, synergies happening with a lot of the ideas you'll see throughout the plan. Um, so one of the big challenges is that there is very little housing in downtown. And uh, one of the ways that we've recommended is again, and I mentioned this already, is to revise zoning and land use regulations to allow for enough intensity and predictability for realistic developments. Um, we have a, page, a couple of pages describing the existing housing stock that's also detailed much more in the economic development um, report. So if you're interested in that, I would recommend looking at the housing numbers in that report. Um, but 58% of the existing housing stock is single family detached housing. Um, and 16%, the next biggest bucket, is uh, smaller apartment buildings that have between five and 19 units. Um, there's what's missing in that overall mix is the middle. So we have uh, the apartment buildings and the condos, and we have a lot of the single family detached. But what's missing is what we call uh, the missing middle. And this is a great way to actually accommodate people without feeling like you have to build a very large building. Um, so these are your townhomes, your fourplexes, your little small cottage or bungalow courts, um, and small multiplex apartment buildings. So we've mapped out where we think there's opportunities for these different and new kinds of housing. And this map was created based on the opportunity sites that we had previously mapped. 
and also the character areas. So we looked at the character areas that we're proposing, we looked at where there's opportunity sites, and we figured out, okay, where, where should we be encouraging these kinds of housing types to occur? And so here you see where we encourage townhomes, duplexes, fourplexes, um, missing middle housing, in other words, where you can accommodate more of the multifamily apartment buildings, um, and also opportunities for aging in place, so assisted and independent living. Yeah. Think about this idea of getting a bigger menu of housing options is that uh, just wanting it doesn't cause it to occur. That housing gets developed because it's a good business to be in for someone who makes a private real estate investment in that. So uh, the, the city has an important role, which is the, its role as regulator. Uh, if you think about the folks who uh, are in the early stages of retirement, for example, living in single family detached houses, but have made friends here and put down roots here and don't plan to go back north uh, right away, then those are folks who, when they reach the point where they no longer maintain a large house on a larger lot or a canal lot, would love to find a place in town where they can downsize and live downstairs without necessarily leaving their friends and their congregation and the water and the, thing, and the weather. So that's a market that is here that is poorly addressed by the offerings in the marketplace. Does that make sense? So the city's role as regulator is how you allow it to happen. It doesn't make it happen, but in the absence of the right regulations, you can inadvertently prevent it. So a developer, for example, that might be interested in building some of that small is beautiful, middle, missing middle housing, isn't going to do it if they have to come beg for a zoning variance or a rezoning or an expensive legal procedure. You have to decide where it would be okay with you to have that infill development take place in that form and then legalize it um, before they ask. So one of the areas we looked at more closely um, as a great candidate to really encourage and incentivize more of the missing middle housing is the area in East Downtown. Um, and we actually tested um, a group of six typical lots. We wanted to test different housing configurations um, to understand what would, how would we need to calibrate the zoning and land development regulations to actually allow these types of configurations to happen. And so here's an example where we took six typical lots together and we tested um, a small apartment with townhomes, townhomes in the back or um, some live work and um, single family buildings that have accessory dwelling units in the back. Or as is the case with the image on the right, we wanted to test what a small cottage court would look like. And here you can see kind of how that could begin to fill in this East Downtown neighborhood. And again, it doesn't happen overnight, so that idea that you know, change can happen, but it typically happens in, in phases. So starting to fill in the trees with street improvements, but also on um, private development happening in the existing lots. And what you're also seeing happening in these is, is the growth of the medical area around Bayfront Health and how we can support that also with different housing types um, that can help serve some of the medical professionals. And that's something we talk about in the plan as well, this idea of medical villages. So this is gaining traction across the country, and it's the idea of focusing all, as much on preventative care as anything else. And that includes walkability, bikeability, so again, synergy with some of the other big ideas in the plan. Um, but this idea that you should really look to connect these health centers to the surrounding neighborhoods in a way that promotes walking and biking. This is something that Lee Health is looking into in Fort Myers um, with a new health village. And here are some ground level shots of what that kind of infill missing middle housing can look like. This is in East Downtown along Milas. This is one of the larger blocks. It's actually double the size of, of most of the typical blocks. So there was an idea to um, actually extend one of the streets through. And this also gives you twice as much street frontage as you previously had. It allows you to build some of these smaller uh, townhome units facing onto the street. 
Um, and here is that gateway development that I mentioned previously into downtown that the um, intersection of Milas and Marion can really serve. Not only does it have two prime development one on sites, one on each side of the street, which can allow you to make something that is special and, and kind of suggests an arrival as you get to Punta Gorda. Um, so this is why it was selected as a, as a key gateway. So the idea of having something special happen at that intersection, the buildings could step back, they could have a small little court or plaza, a little tiny um, special roof line element or small tower element at that corner as well. And another area where we've looked at different housing types um, is along Henry and Maud. So here you can see the street being reconfigured to allow different kinds of housing. You have everything from single family detached at the lower right corner of this image. You have townhomes, opportunity for some live work, also opportunity uh, for assisted living or independent living. The idea of making a multi-generational community with several different types of housing that will allow people to age in place in a way that they feel comfortable. And I'll bring Victor up for idea number four. Uh, this section is about transportation, uh, about mobility. Uh, but it is about more than just uh, the vehicle that you travel in uh, or on. It's about making a better public realm very early on, uh, Louisa showed a map that showed priority public realm enhancement in uh, investment locations. Uh, and you're, you're going to want to go look at that because it's tied to this section as well. And we decided to title this the way we did, Fully Embrace Walking and Biking, because all of us in this room know your town is a driving town. Motoring is well accommodated in your town. In fact, uh, much of the town was set up around the idea of happy motoring. Uh, and that's going really well. There are some things we could do to make it a little easier, uh, including make it possible for people that are driving to drive a little less far with all the benefits that might bring, like time saved and less uh, emissions coming out of their tailpipe uh, and less energy wasted uh, when they're doing it. But we decided to emphasize walking here because of the dual role that your streets have. They have this job to help you move around as a transportation facility. We use that phrase, investments in expanded and upgraded transportation facilities. Uh, that's what the DOT calls streets. Um, that make walking and biking safe, convenient, and attractive while also spurring private investment in the key growth areas. And that's the connection to the map. The idea is this. You want it to be drivable and accommodate the automobile well without necessarily letting that dominate out all other forms of moving around and the making of great addresses. So this dual role, your streets have to serve as transportation facilities, but they also have to serve as public places where people want to be that makes them into great addresses. Think about it like this. When you pass into town uh, for, through one of those gateways that Louisa described, you're going to receive a message from the city about what kind of place it is. It's where your brand, in a marketing sense, is established in the minds of your visitors and your residents. And so we aren't just moving around. We're having experiences. And if there are more positive experiences, that will be better. Uh, well, the key thing here is that the improvements that will make the walking and biking parts of transportation better are also the same improvements that will make it look better and help with the brand rather than diminishing the brand. We have, as in the other chapters, a section that, that runs down through the big challenges, the details in this case, and then what kinds of investments and policies would help. Well, over in the challenges, most of them are details. And the biggest ones, well, the speed and the lack of trees. The parts of town that people like the most are the ones with lots of trees, the parts of town people respond to the least well and have spent the less money, least money improving are the ones where the street trees are missing. The speed is crucial because not only does high speed make it more dangerous, whether you're in a vehicle with all the protection and technology designed to protect you, or outside a vehicle as a vulnerable user of that space, like somebody on two feet or two wheels. Managing the speed is how you keep it safer. 
And by the way, if you're thinking of, having a, of, of opening a sidewalk cafe, you'd probably rather open it on a street where the cars that are in the street are going by in a measure, at a measured pace, reasonably slowly, not at, not at something that feels like the Indianapolis 500 is, is speeding by your business, right? So this is the connection between the economic part and the transportation part. There's a map in here, which we've zoomed in on a little bit uh, to show you there, of some very important places to make improvements. And these are improvements that will affect all sorts of things, like how far you have to drive or uh, how you deal with the storm water when it, when it rains. Uh, but we call them pedestrian improvements because they need to be designed for people on foot and then add those, all the other features to it to make it work. And those include a couple of places where we, again, attempting our best to be thought-provoking, carried over an idea from the 2005 master plan, which was the one-way to two-way restoration for Marion and Olympia in particular. There are some places where the streets are wider than they need to be. And the extra asphalt is encouraging higher speeds, so we've recommended to put the fat streets on a diet and bring them back down to the right size. There are a couple of places where we've recommended what the transportation technicians call shared space, uh, typically curbless streets or very slow speed streets where cars are allowed to come in, but they move around on pedestrians' terms. And, uh, when, and as a whole, it feels more like a plaza or shared space. There are a couple of locations where we've recommended specific intersection improvements. Working with our transportation engineer, Rick Hall, whom many of you met, uh, this is a chance to achieve both the gateway effect, good for branding, but also safety improvements, and help people navigate the conversion from uh, what is now one-way streets to future two-way streets. So there is a section that we knew this would be something people would want to know a lot about. So we invested uh, some extra inches in the publication on why all of this is there. There's a, there's a description of how we can safely calm the traffic speeds down and why we do it. The big headline there is safety. Uh, with, for example, the road diet technique that I described, we can get a reduction in the number of crashes. Uh, that ranges from 19 to 47 percent. If you could make the number of crashes go down by a quarter or a half for just the public health benefit alone, you would probably want to do that. So that's there. It also brings up the idea that if you can put the street on a diet, you also get room to do things that in the past it seemed like there wasn't any room for, like street trees or on-street parking or uh, extra space for bikes and pedestrians. Now, this, a number of your key sort of uh, centerpiece streets are not local roads. They're state facilities. A couple of things there that everyone needs to know. First, the state of Florida fundamentally changed their rule book for the design of such streets in the last year and a half. And starting January 2018 and with revisions in January 2019, they threw out the old book, or really threw out 12 old books, and replaced them with one new one. It's called the Florida Design Manual. And what it says that's so revolutionary is that the one-size-fits-all approach the DOT used to take to all the streets, basically insisting that they all be designed in a suburban high-speed way, uh, like a highway, instead of in an urban way that belongs in a street in a town. They replaced that with alternative prescriptions depending on where you are. It's called context sensitivity. It means figure out where you are on the map and then the street design rules under the state manual vary with it. And we have picked that up and recommended for how you should uh, work with DOT District 1 to make sure that their map of your contexts matches your goals for the community. <coughs> So that's explained here. Then the next part is uh, a rundown on the benefits of restoring streets to two-way traffic. Uh, we realized this is an idea that was in the 2005 plan. It came up more than once since then, but it either was just a little too complicated or uh, politically fraught, and it was saved for another day. Um, we're emboldened by the fact that you adopted that plan at all, given that that 
uh, dramatic idea was in it. So points for boldness, at least in adopting the plan. And it emboldened us a bit to put it in this one because we, and we've made an attempt to explain it a little better uh, that I hope you'll all read through. And, uh, and if the time is right uh, during the life of this plan, you'll be able to, to do that. Now, of course, Marion and Olympia are the two big topics where that's concerned. And so we did some very precise drawings that show how the street itself can be redesigned to allow for circulation and convenience with the two-way traffic flow. Uh, and that does mean that people who have been used to it one way would get, have to get used to it again, a new way, two-way. But on the other hand, all of the newcomers uh, will not have to go through that hazing ritual of becoming accustomed to your one-way streets uh, as they arrive. At the ends of this, of course, there are some special intersections, uh, like where Marion meets Henry, and we have recommended uh, that there be some special intersection designs to go with those transitions, including other uh, places where there needs to be a sim simplified signalized crossing or where uh, a roundabout will take care of it. US Highway 41 is the elephant in the room. That's that Indianapolis 500 speedway that I was talking about a minute ago. And getting it to be the right size so that there's room for the missing street trees and so that the behavior you're encouraged to, to take on as a motorist uh, is correct, uh, will require a redesign. And so we have recommended here a redesign for the street to accommodate two lanes of traffic on one side, eliminate the left turn only lane, and that will make room for the other things uh, that are needed in the space. Now our, our transportation engineer here, uh, uh, FDOT veteran Richard Hall, stood out there with his radar gun measuring your behaviors in these locations. <laughs> if you can't see the number on the readout on his handheld device there, it says 53 miles per hour. That's too fast. Given that when there's a crash between a pedestrian and a motorist at more than 40 miles an hour, there's an 80 to 90% likelihood that it will be a fatal crash. So 53 miles per hour, whichever one of you it was that he clocked, that was too fast. But we know that it could be any of us because when the street is designed to encourage high speeds, we all take advantage of that invitation. And so there is a design here uh, in the document for right-sizing US 41 through downtown. Um, and this is meant to be the starter design that you would take to FDOT District 1 and sit with them and work out the engineering particulars and how to time the intersections and their signals uh, so that all of the good things about 41, like the flow when you need flow and hurricane evacuation when you need that, are all maintained, even while you get the speed safety benefits that I was talking about. Now, on to biking. There is a new attempt here in the draft document to recommend the future bicycle network in the form of a map. Uh, including places where it's as simple as marking the street to make it clear that every lane is a bike lane and the bikes may use the full lane. Or where it's necessary to install something more uh, specialized and engineered, like a two-way uh, or one-way protected bike path. Uh, where conventional bike lanes are appropriate, and very importantly, where there can be off-road recreational trails. So this is where those key investments and policies I talked about a minute ago come in. Uh, the trail network you've had such success with, and a new piece is coming online now uh, in the near future, uh, they are part of making the network complete so that when you uh, need to use a street to operate your bike, you can, but when you can use an off-road path, you can do that instead. The fifth idea is that strategic, not overdoing it, just right commercial development. So Louisa will walk through that now. Thank you. And just one a more comment on the bicycle network we put together. That really is building off of what ideas we got from the community and previous plans for a bike network. So there was a great base to start with, and we just kind of enhanced it from there. Uh, the yes, exactly. Maybe more ambitious. Just a little. But we have to try. <laughs> so... The central idea for strategic commercial development, 
um, is that commercial development incentives and revised zoning and land use regulations, as well as marketing and economic development efforts, attract new businesses to come to Punta Gorda, helping to balance the city's tax base and diversify its residents. So one of the biggest challenges is the limited availability of leasable commercial space, which essentially means that people wanting to start new businesses um, or small prospective small business owners don't have a lot of options of where they can locate. And a lot of times they would have to build the space that they would then occupy. Um, and so a lot of, uh, one big piece in fixing that is to, again, actively encourage the redevelop or the development of large opportunity sites, and particularly to allow mixed use development to occur there. And that includes revising and calibrating the land use and zoning regulations in order to do that. So in the same way that we created a map that identified opportunity areas for new housing types, we also created a map to identify areas for strategic commercial development and, and what kinds of commercial development we would ideally want to see happening there. And again, this goes back to the character areas map and where there's actual uh, clusters of opportunity sites. So for example, in Fisherman's Village and downtown, we want to see more of the waterfront, entertainment, dining, boutique retail. Um, in the traditional neighborhoods, there might be some small nodes and opportunities for neighborhood serving commercial and, and small offices. And then in the south downtown area is where we might expect to see some more class A office and mixed use commercial. And so there's a lot of different ways that you can encourage strategic commercial development. And like Victor said, with housing, it's not just gonna happen on its own, and it requires uh, a closer look at the current regulations and revisions so that these things can actually happen. And then there's ways to set tiered impact fees. Um, you can adopt flexible codes to allow for the maximum number of types of, of commercial uses in a particular location. Um, you can partner with existing anchor institutions to help them see how they might expand their existing footprint. Um, you can create programs locally to help build developers' uh, capacity. And there's a number of other things that we go into in more detail in the plan. Um, one idea that came out of the plan as well is an idea of potentially designating a maker district uh, downtown uh, with the idea of the Ice House being kind of the anchor institution and there's a lot of more um, warehouse, warehouse type buildings in this area. And this would really be more of a marketing and branding effort to encourage more of what we call PDR spaces. And these are production, distribution, and repair type uses. Um, you can also mix that with new art spaces. You're right, so a maker district is a district, again, that has these types of uses, anything from auto-oriented to small, um, small manufacturing, light industrial uses. Um, it really is, is meant to be truly flexible, uh, and it, it could include some element of, 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 um, of food components such as uh, a food hall or um, a brewery, for example. And these are things we're seeing pop up in a lot of places. Um, so there can be incentives, there can be programs that can, can be coupled with economic development strategies that seek those kinds of small businesses and um, encourage them to come here. And I'm going to sound like a broken record, but this goes along with everything else we've said in the plan. Um, a key part of an economic development strategy is creating a more vibrant downtown and diversifying the housing types and making the city more bike and, and more friendly to pedestrians and people on their bikes. All of that is an economic development strategy and it makes it easier to attract businesses who might want to locate here. <laughs> Um, so here is one of the ideas we recycled from the 2005 Citizens Master Plan. We simplified it slightly, but there was in that master plan a very bold idea to create a new public space to serve as one of the key gateways into downtown. And this is in the intersection of Taylor and US 41. And so I think in their plan they had a couple of, of green spaces, one on top of the other. And so we've condensed that down to one. Um, and again, this would happen in phases. So what you're seeing in the upper right corner is this idea of the maker district filling in the couple of more buildings that are um, geared towards production, distribution, repair, um, artisans, 
any kind of maker, really. Then you see the new public space, what that can be like. Also, right sizing of US 41, as Victor mentioned. This is a good shot where you can see at the bottom of the page, it's actually two lanes. And then it balloons out to three as you go up. And so here we've shown that um, getting narrower, the up possibility for a separated cycle track facility as well. New commercial and mixed use developments on either side. And in the fullness of time, how that can extend all the way up. Another idea we've talked about and we identified these areas in our character area map is what we call a neighborhood center. So there's different ways to design neighborhood centers and it really depends on your zoning code and any architectural guidelines what those neighborhood centers could look like. They can look um, more like suburban strip areas that we're all accustomed to or they can be designed to help promote more walking and biking in the surrounding neighborhood. So here's just an example, and we look at um, a couple of these in the plan of how um, PGI can get a neighborhood center that might promote more walkability, bikeability, and encourage more strategic commercial. Um, so again, in time, filling that in, keeping the existing uh, retail that is there, and keeping a big chunk of the parking as well, but creating some new public spaces, having the buildings face the streets and welcome people in what new um, housing development could also look like. And this is what it could be in the fullness of time. And this, this, these illustrations are really just to show how the guidelines and zoning that you set up can help ensure some of these outcomes. And again, some of what you're seeing, um, there's public space improvements, having a war, uh, walkway along the lake there. And here's what it looks like from the ground level. Um, so here we are on Akia Sta and Simaron Drive. So there's not much there now, but in the fullness of time, you can encourage more of these mixed use buildings, um, keeping the, uh, the heights low, creating public spaces, adding shade trees and all the elements that Victor has discussed as well. High visibility crosswalks as well for safety. And so here's, again, some of that that's happening. The high visibility crosswalks, um, potential to, add, to widen the sidewalks in the fullness of time to accommodate cyclists and pedestrians. And Hold that for a second. yeah, down, right? absolutely. A couple of times we've mentioned the, uh, that implementation step, which will, is right at the top of our list of things recommended for you to do. And that's, updating the land development regulations, fixing your zoning code, in other words. Well, that's the place where, depending on what you write into the documents, you determine the future building to street relationships. Like if, for example, you want the buildings to have storefronts facing sidewalks in the way you would expect them in a walkable traditional community, whether it's Key West or St. Augustine or Savannah or somewhere like that, uh, that's where you specify it. And so the image that you see here is kind of a, a, a what if picture that depicts the kinds of things that would be under your control once you fix the zoning. That's also worth looking at and flipping back and forth when you have the book uh, between this and the map of where such things might be done in the town. Most of its applicability is outside Burnstore Isles and, and Punta Gorda Isles. There's just a little dab of land in each of those maps for BGI, or BSI and PGI that where it could be applicable. And then there's much more land in the historic districts and in the maker district that she described uh, where you could make that idea applicable. But the whole point is if you want to allow for strategic development but not let it get out of control, your main controlling mechanism is the zoning. So one other big opportunity site that we haven't yet discussed is the Jones Loop Road area. And of course there are multiple iterations of what could happen on this site. We wanted to illustrate the potential for another neighborhood center um, in this area as well, but also that this could be an area for different kinds of commercial growth as well. Um, so it could start with, could st and housing, of course. Um, 
So it could start with a concentrated area, a neighborhood center, some housing as well. Um, it could grow out. As you see, we've just seen some more of the highway commercial happening on the right side of the screen, as well as adding more housing and growing outward. Eventually, you can connect these two things, um, having kind of the larger footprint buildings along Jones Loop Road and having a transition to smaller single family residential throughout the neighborhood. Another, um, and here is it potentially in the fullness of time, a couple of things to note here. Um, leaving the area along Alligator Creek as a nature preserve we thought was important. You can connect it through this kind of central green spine, which would be a public space, to connect people from throughout the neighborhood down to Alligator Creek. Um, we're also, uh, we've talked, to, we talk about it in the plan, and I, I wanted to mention this idea of potentially, because of the amount of land that's available here, introducing uses and permitting uses like community agriculture, which we've seen in some new um, neighborhoods and new towns. Um, across the country as a potential use as well. Here's a, a labeled version of that where you can see some of the different components that Louisa described. When you stare at that map, and I know this is a, the first time we've had a chance to show that to a big audience, you're going to see that the physical form of it is more like the old town and less like the mid 20th century suburban development. That, for example, the streets are arranged into blocks or a network, a web, rather than like a tree, right? And that's, that's the fundamental one. And then uh, the buildings themselves tend to be uh, focused on, on those streets, street-oriented, with more private op outdoor open space and rear yards and back-of-house things in the middle of the block. So the, there's a real front uh, of the building, of each building, whether it's a house or a mixed use building or an office building or a store, it can, it uh, has a front side and that front side is engaged with the street in the way that we talked about um, ending the zoning to allow. So the whole idea here was to say, if there is to be a substantial new patch of growth, maybe one of the last substantial new patches of growth on previously undeveloped land in the city here at Jones Loop Road, the reason for which Jones Loop Road was created in the first place, if that's to happen, build it in the way that builds more of the Punta Gorda people seem to love the most. And uh, that's where that network of streets, traditional neighborhood kind of form comes from. If you do it well enough, uh, it will, uh, when, it's, when it's done, feel like it's been there uh, as long as the oldest parts of town. And we wanted to end with this one. This is new for a lot of folks, so we wanted to show these images and kind of explain that there are many, many opportunities with Jones Loop Road um, and many different kinds of strategic commercial that you could include here from neighborhood center type commercial, uh, neighborhood serving commercial, but also all the way to class A office and highway style commercial as well. And so now, I get to the end, <laughs> um, and I want to speak a bit towards the implementation and ongoing engagement chapter, which is at the very end of the plan. And so we have a very large matrix um, where we've created action items for every single thing in the plan. Um, and in it, we've organized them into overall strategies and the actions that would implement those strategies. Um, but we've also organized them by the type of implementation measures, so whether it's a capital improvement project um, or a city policy or regulation, or maybe it's a new city program or city service. Um, we've also organized it by time frame. So is this an immediate action? Is it ongoing? Um, something that has to be constantly updated? Is it a long-term? action, you know, one of these more ambitious or bold items that we think would happen in the fullness of time, um, but not immediately. We've also identified responsible parties as well as potential partners for each of the action items. We've also identified um, estimated costs, roughly, and potential funding sources as well. Um, 
So we, we welcome any uh, feedback to this, particularly when it comes to potential partners. We're always looking for feedback from the community. You know, have we identified the right partners? Maybe you have some ideas about that to help us actually accomplish a lot of these. And so we, we include this in the draft plan itself, and we're repeating it here. Um, there is always opportunities for ongoing engagement for this plan, both right now and after it's adopted. Um, so we definitely want to hear your ideas and your feedback about everything we've presented tonight and everything in the plan itself. We'll be accepting comments through September 6th. You can visit puntagordamasterplan.com slash engage to give written feedback. City Planning Commission will convene um, Monday, August 26th at 2 p.m. to discuss the draft plan. And what we'll do is we'll organize all this feedback that we get uh, a, a, in addition to all the comments and suggestions we receive from council members and from Planning Commission, and that will be folded into what will become the final plan. So what comes next? Um, Monday, September 23rd, City Planning Commission will provide their recommendations to City Council about the final plan, and then either October 2nd or the 16th City Council will vote on plan adoption. But this is not the end. Even after adoption, there are plenty of ways to keep engaged. If you are interested in these topics, you can speak on record at City Council meetings, attend Planning Commission meetings, attend the Historic uh, Preservation Advisory Board. You can meet and talk with city staff. They have a very open door policy. So it definitely doesn't end here. You can join one of the many advisory boards um, and committees as well. And we are gonna leave this very big so you can see it. Um, now we'd like to move on to comments. I'm gonna invite up Melissa, uh, who is going to help moderate some of the questions. And we have allotted 30 minutes, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, just around 30 minutes to hear some initial uh, comments and respond to some of your questions as well. Melissa's going to moderate because we're not sure if your questions or comments are best directed toward one of us in the consultant team or toward the city staff, including your city urban designer, uh, Mitchell Austin, uh, or Melissa. So if you want to just uh, pick on whichever one of us you want to address the thing, if it's a question. If, as for our comments, we're recording, so we will get down anything you say into the mic, and we've got two of them. Right, they're, they're right up front here. I do want to make a special point before we get started that we should all remember that we're all a part of creating this plan, and that's one of the best things about Punta Gorda is the resident engagement, the stakeholder engagement. Everybody is willing to express their opinions, and that's the only way that this plan is going to get stronger and be something that we can stand behind for years to come, is if you share your comments, share your feedback, tell us what you like, tell us what you don't like, what you'd like tweaked, we really want to listen. Staff wants to listen, your city council wants to listen so please make your way to the mic and fire away state your name though right away too please hi Craig Eric from uh, PGI um, I'd like what I've seen and heard today but what I haven't heard are any infrastructure changes to deal with downtown flooding during storms and the increased severity of the storms frequency of the storms or the, the rising water level in Charlotte Harbor? Yep, I can take this one. Thank you. Um, we do have some act specific action items that look at not only the health of the harbor, um, but also a lot of what the city is already doing to prepare for sea level rise. So there, there are specific action items that talk to that, but it's certainly something that we can try and highlight more and look more into as we make refinements to the plan. Thank you. Go ahead. Gary Skillicorn, Punagorda Isles. Uh, as, as a part of this, there will be population increases associated with it. Question is, has there been analysis of city capacities, water, sewer, in order to meet the capacity problems, or are we going to have to start digging streets and replacing facilities? Those are great questions. And yes, there was an assessment of uh, all the systems. New York City Comprehensive Plan is the starting point for that because as a matter of state law, those infrastructure needs have to be identified and 
attached to population growth. So as the uh, need for more services arrives, the infrastructure has to be in place to meet that need. So that doesn't change as a result of what's shown here. Every, though, in most cases, we talked about what would be above the ground if you re refurbish or recondition a street. But in many, many cases, if you are redoing a street to adjust the uh, things I talked about, like street trees or the design speed, you would also simultaneously replace any worn parts of the system, like failing sewer laterals or failing sub-base, those kind, or an adaptation uh, necessary to deal with flooding and, and stormwater issues. So that's part of the attitude taken here in everything related to infrastructure, which is um, as, you, as you grow and change, uh, build infrastructure that gets you more than one benefit for the dollars that you spend. And so that, that's embedded throughout the, as, a, as an approach throughout the whole document. Now that said, you have a, a, uh, a, a substantial capacity when it comes to sewer, for example. And uh, so there's, there's, every, there's still a good opportunity to do conversions from septic to sewer, for example without worrying about whether you have the capacity to accept those additional flushing toilets and sinks. Thank you for that question. Sir? Yes, I'm Jim Blue uh, from PGI. Um, I read your uh, master plan for North Beach, okay. North Miami Beach, and uh, one of the five big ideas that you had in that was mitigation of sea level rise. Um, considering the fact that we were going to share the same sea, um, why wasn't that incorporated in one of the five big ideas for Punta Gorda? Well, uh, Mitchell can speak to that. Yeah, um, so We're into it. You're right about that. <laughs> yes. Uh, so the city has had a climate adaptation plan since 2009. Uh, we were actually in the process of updating that plan because we received some grant money from uh, FDEP, Florida Department of Environmental Protection. And uh, that process was actually running pretty much simultaneously with this process. So Dover Cole has had a copy of that document. Um, uh, as soon as we've got the draft completed and that document will be going to city council on more or less the same timeline as this one. Uh, so the, there is a climate adaptation plan uh, for the city existing and we have taken action on, on that over the last decade and it is something that's embedded in our planning process already. So it's not really a new big idea. It's something that we've been doing as a community. Will that ultimately be interleaved with this? Yes, sir, well. Yes, yes. And, and we've put in our action items, um, speaking to, to the, the simultaneous parallel process of to continue existing city efforts on this front um, and expand them in the future as necessary. So it's, it's in that implementation chapter, again, as I mentioned, to make sure that the two documents support each other ultimately when it comes to implementing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Sir? Hi, uh, Bob Fritz, Bernst Royals. Um, Two of the driving forces of this master plan thing uh, that really got kicked it in gear were building heights in the downtown area and the uh, 89 versus 11% uh, tax issue. Uh, what I'm seeing from your plans here isn't gonna help that 89, 11%, it's gonna make it worse. I see residential condos everywhere infill, downtown, Fisherman's Village, and what really surprises me is Jones Loop Road. You know, uh, Jones Loop, uh, we always suspected it would be big box uh, Trader Joe's, something like that, not, not condos and single family and a farm, okay, as you show. Uh, to me, that's, Jones Loop is really an issue, uh, that area. Uh, the density and the height of the condo, so you say 75 feet with 50 units per acre uh, in, the, in the marketplace property, okay? That's 75 feet, you have to go above floodplain, then you have to do rooftop units. You're gonna be 95 feet by the time you're finished, okay? I don't think really, not a lot of us wanted that to begin with. Uh, I would really take a look at that because that's a heavy density. And the residential, you showed a PG Waterfront Hotel gone and new condos there. So really, it's just, uh, 
I don't know, just a lot of residential and that's not gonna help our tax base as it is now. Thank you. Thank you, uh, sir. Yeah, Brian Sharp, I, uh, outspoken critic of this plan. Um, not only design-wise, I think uh, it's boring and traditional and it, it's not futuristic looking. I think we need to incorporate some basic principles of modernism, various materials, more color, just, I, I don't like the design. Uh, I've been out here for the last three months since the charrettes, talking to citizens, surveying people, and not one time have I heard one citizen say that they want high-rise condos at Market Square, not one. Everybody I have talked to says they, in your surveys show that they like the downtown feel, they like the small town feel of Puna Gorda, that's what attracts people to this area. Therefore, what creates that is the festivals that we have downtown. We have a tree lighting ceremony that you guys don't seem to care about. Um, and if you build these condos down there, it will destroy the downtown feel. The other thing, I work with affordable housing and I can tell you that none of these people out here will allow affordable housing downtown. Those condos will be three to $5,000 a unit and the only people that'll be able to afford those condos will be sitting right here in this room. So it's not gonna fix the housing crisis. You still have not addressed workforce housing. Uh, the I'm opposed to the boat club because it's unconstitutional if you've got a, a club that requires dues that the public is not, does not have access to, okay? We should not have to pay for that. I propose that we put a boardwalk, this lady right here uh, come up with this idea, I think it's a great idea that we build a boardwalk at Gilcrest Park as opposed to the boat club. We do not want and need a boat club for $4 million. I'm opposed to most of this plan. Thank you for sharing your comments. Do you have any follow up on that, Louisa or Victor? No, no need, okay. Come on up, sir. How you doing? Mark Onerman, Punta Gorda Isles. Uh, quick question about the traffic studies. It's a great picture, that 53, that was me. Sorry, sorry. Um, I like to drive fast. Now, but my concern is more about, you know, we talk about that downtown plan we have. I don't even know what the number of residents we're adding to the community. Um, let's face it, this is Florida. You know, I know we have an average temperature of 75, but that's an average. You know, we have a lot of rain in the summer. I love to ride my bike, but I have not been able to get out there in two months. Okay, so a lot of these pictures you see people walking, there's one car in the street, that's great. My concern is you're talking about an art center downtown, dozens if not hundreds of new condos in the area. And I know this is over the course of time, but there's no street expansion. Now, sir, I understand your dietary street plan, and I, you know, in a lot of ways understand the shared space, but still the reality is not every day can we be out on those bicycles. And then on top of that, we have an elderly population who comes down here for half the year. They're not going to be walking. Maybe, you know, that's, that's general. They're not going to, uh, they come down here for almost a vacation time. A lot of people are active, but not everyone's going to get out there and walk or ride a bike. I mean, so my concern is the thoroughfares between your downtown and Fisherman's Village. Now, that's going to get a lot of bottleneck. You're looking at Fisherman's Village development, again, the same story. Hundreds of new, you know, new families moving in. That street between Marion down to, you know, from Fisherman's Village up to the town center, I see a lot of bottleneck. I see gridlock, and man, I moved here to get away from that. <laughs> so that's just my two cents on it, just something to think about. Thank you very much. No, that's really useful. And I, just for those who haven't had a chance to dive into that material yet, uh, the, all the work related to transportation that's reflected here is is the work of licensed professional engineer, transportation planner and engineer, Rick Hall, who uh, is able to be with us tonight. But he would want you to know that he's the first thing he's done is take into account the traffic volumes existing and forecast for these areas. And so if we've suggested, for example, an additional piece of street network, or we've pushed back against a suggestion to close a street that allows for circulation today, that's because we're doing exactly what the gentleman recommended, and that's taking into account the need to circulate in cars, not just other ways, now and in the future. So I hope that's reassuring, but, uh, and we can do that more at the numbers, if you like, uh, intersection by intersection. 
Okay, sir. Hi, Gary, Gary Marty, Punta Gorda. All right, let's talk about the streets first. Uh, anybody who's here during season knows if you take away a lane on 41, it's backed up north, it's backed up south. I don't see any way that that's going to work. If you make Olympia and Marion, uh, you change that to two-way traffic on either side, I think that's bad for your flow. I think you need to concentrate on growing Olympia so that Olympia more reflects what you have going on in Marion. Okay? Uh, as far as the market square and putting residential downtown, that's a big no-no. We had an issue here a, f a couple of months ago about reducing music in downtown Punta Gorda. In a matter of two weeks, 5,000 people signed a petition that they want entertainment downtown. They do not want residential. And that was in a two-week period that 5,000 people signed that. I think what people want is that Market Square is kept what it, not what it is, because it's ugly. But it needs an and, and privately owned. <laughs> I, well, I understand that, and all of this, all of these properties are privately owned. So, you know, the state owns 41, so you can't even, you know, that's up to them. But, you know, that's what people came here for. That's why they're here. What you're proposing is turning Punta Gorda into Naples. Nobody here wants to live in Naples. Naples was a great town 25 years ago. It looked a lot like Punta Gorda. Nobody wants to drive through there now. You know, there's a lots of land in this, t in this city uh, east of 41. Lots of open land that can all be developed into residential and commercial space. You're talking about putting more commercial downtown, which is, you know, taking away you know, all the festivals that go on in that market square. You know, I, I understand that they're very small now, but if it was a dedicated space for that, that brings people into town to spend money at the businesses in this town. You know, that's all I got to say. Thanks. <laughs> Sir? Hello, my name's Tom Desenfants. Uh, my wife, Catherine, and I have been full-time residents to Punta Gorda for 13 years. And I think like the majority of people here, we wouldn't live anywhere else. Um, when we were looking for, to build a retirement home, we were living in downtown Indianapolis. Uh, we discovered Punta Gorda and subsequently built a home here. But one of the things we greatly enjoyed in living in downtown Indianapolis was we could park the car after returning home from work on Friday afternoon. In many cases, never had to get out of the car till Monday when I had to drive to work. Catherine could walk to work. I applaud the vision of making walkable streets, bikeable streets in downtown Punta Gorda where we can have residential, commercial stores, better have a grocery store. As we age, Catherine and I have talked about the fact that we're probably not gonna wanna continue to maintain a home. Uh, on the canal with the boat and all that. But as we look around Punta Gorda, even the condos, you're gonna to have to get in an automobile to drive to the store or do whatever. I believe if we have developments such as you proposed in downtown Punta Gorda, it will be absolutely applicable to many of the residents as we grow older and decide that we wanna have a little simpler style living and a walkable lifestyle. So I think that uh, I would urge people to take an open mind looking at what's been proposed. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, my name is uh, George Lynch, and I'm a 15-year uh, resident in PGI. And I guess I realize you've been working on the master plan for at least six months, but it's being presented to us today in draft form and we're given two weeks to make comments, and you guys already have a planned approval for October. It's why is it necessary for this to be on such a fast track, you know, without really a lot of uh, opportunity for the citizens to, to comment? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mitchell, did you have any comment? Go ahead. Hi, my name is Rich Vernsey. I live in Punta Gorda. Um, 
I moved here in 1986, been here a long time. I uh, have lived in some other places, Tampa, Chicago, et cetera. And, uh, you know, when I lived in Chicago, I thought, man, this city is pretty cool, how they've got these stacked streets, and how did they come about all this? Well, the whole place burned to the ground one year, and they had the opportunity to build it in uh, the way that they wanted to. So I think with the, you know, catastrophe that Charlie was, and I was here, uh, the ability to take the city in a mindful direction is a great opportunity. And I think if you live anywhere in Florida, we have explosive growth. Um, I recently drove north to south, and you pass like 100 U-Hauls. People are moving here like crazy. And I think, you know, 41 is busy. If you don't build in downtown Punta Gorda, then you're going to have mega residential getting built upstream regardless. Traffic is heavy. People are moving here. I just, uh, I think to have this opportunity is great, and uh, I enjoyed the presentation and the plan. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Paul Uselskis, PGI. New to the area. Appreciate the area. Appreciate your effort, your forward thinking. I have a couple questions for clarification. One is, what is the demographic that you are seeking then to attract to this area since you say they have to drive 20, 30 minutes to get here? Who are these people? What are their typical salaries? What kind of uh, employment do they have? Um, and would that change the financial demographic to the area as you bring them in? That's one. And two is uh, my question, because I'm in the medical field, uh, is there anything in your plan that is looking to kind of give a new face or look to Bayfront? I think one of the things that I'm hearing of this community that's a little older than myself is, is the question of, uh, is, are the services there are reputable, uh, you know, to match your desire to grow? And if it's dismatched or not matched, what can be done to bring up both sectors? Thank you. I can answer some of those. Yes, so we did look specifically at the demographics of the working population here in Punta Gorda. And I can give you just a very brief kind of synopsis of that. And again, there's a lot more detail in this plan that I'm sure, sure. And you can take a look at it now if you want. Um, essentially, Punta Gorda is largely a service, um, relies heavily on the service industry. And those are a lot of the folks who are having to commute from further away in order to work here. We did several meetings with business owners, local business owners, and it was one of the key challenges that they identified is retaining talent. Um, that they find it hard to attract talent and, and keep them here working. And a lot of the reasons for that is that there's not enough housing options that are accessible to them. And also, the, and as a result, they have really far commute times. And this is, will be potentially exacerbated by some of the new developments, especially the Sunseeker across the bridge. So um, finding ways to get them living closer um, was identified as, as a, a, one of the goals of this project. Other sectors that were looked at for growth, and this would be part of a larger economic development strategy, are professionals um, in the medical field, specifically also looking to grow some of the manufacturing and distribution uh, businesses around town, and uh, as well as potentially looking at aviation as well as a, as a sector for growth. So that's around the airport specifically. So there's a lot more in the budgetary and economic development report about that specifically if you're interested in it. It has all the numbers. And yeah. uh, When we speak about adding more housing options for folks of modest incomes, we are maybe in one uh, way of thinking about the licensed practical nurse or uh, school teacher type um, person who's traveling a long distance to work. Uh, if a neurosurgeon wants to find a house badly enough in Punta Gorda, they can find one on the neurosurgeon's salary. But all the other people that are working uh, around those professionals are having a, an increasing squeeze. Basically, uh, in answer to your original question about how much they make, there is a gap between where wages are not rising as fast as rents, but the actual available inventory of something to own or rent at 
a reasonable mid-market price is getting squeezed as well. So that goes right hand in hand with those before and after pictures of the area east of the, in the eastern part of downtown that Louisa showed, where it's all around Bayfront, where there are whole city blocks, acres and acres and acres of vacant land. So development there is already served by roads, by water, by sewer, by schools, by public safety. And uh, as compared to finding room to grow or accommodate population in some uh, far-flung location. So those are definitely the right places to try and put those unused uh, lots back into service. And employers, Bayfront included, but all employers these days that are struggling with this issue in almost every housing market in the country, are you, know, you increasingly turn to them and say, let's figure out a way to partner in order to facilitate the growth of housing your own employees can afford. So it's an employee recruitment and retention tool, not just a roof over heads. Now, that said, it still has to pencil, as the developers say. So what that means is, in order to make new development that includes attainable or workforce housing prices, you'll have to have more development than that because the gap in costs is gonna to have to be met by market rate development. A, a neighborhood where people wanna be so badly that they pay enough for the creation of that new building that if a percentage of the units in that building or a percentage of the cottages on that block are offered at a more affordable price, the developer is making up the difference on the market rate units. So that means we need to change the brand a little to turn vacant land that remains vacant year after year after year, long after the structures damaged by Charlie were removed. We have to rebrand that land and get the attention of those investors and make them feel like it would be worth it to put one brick on top of another and build your way out of your problems. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So, it, so in terms of affecting the overall income profile of the city, you will need to add a number of people with choices and high incomes in the process of accommodating more of the workers uh, that are all, that are also here, it's a both and rather than either or proposition. Yes, yeah. I acknowledge the double edge, and is this one on? <laughs> I acknowledge the double edge, and for for those of you who live here uh, year round and enjoy the down season, I guess versus the high season. As I look at just the hospital question alone and make some assumptions as I consider their situation. Um, what would, from my, assess, from my opinion, the way I look at things, what would help is if there was some stability in terms of workflow. Then they could have some stability in terms of staffing. But that's not the nature of this area right now. And so that's why I say it's a double edge because people want to retain uh, the, the look and the feel of this area, yet in order to have the the guts working like the hospital from my perspective as well as the downtown you need to have some consistency which i hear this plan angling toward um, it kind of goes together so i just wanted to share that as part of my assessment that we need some stability in terms of workflow uh, thank yes. you thank you yeah. sir thank you and can much. i add just one more thing that i didn't mention in my presentation but it is in the plan we did look at uh, Gulf Coast Partnerships reports on affordable housing and different initiatives from the Housing Authority, and we do have specific policy items that address affordable housing as well. So that, that is in there. <laughs> Ma'am? Hi, I'm Jane Hayes. I live east Punta Gorda, uh, so a little bit different area than most people making comments tonight. Also, I'm a retired transportation planner. First thing I thought of when I came here full time three years ago is we have to Tulane, Marion, and Olympia. And so I'm glad to see that in your plan. However, from my previous work experience, I know this is the Punta Gorda, a Punta Gorda plan, Punta Gorda city limits, but have you briefed Charlotte County staff? Have you briefed the MPO staff? Have you briefed FDOT? and what are their initial reactions on the transportation recommendations? Um, Mitchell Austin, uh, Chief Planner. So the, 
the city has been in contact throughout this planning process with FDOT staff that are responsible for the US 41 and US 17 corridors uh, through the city. Uh, they're well aware. Before this process started last year, we were doing a transportation and build out study um, to support uh, the findings of this plan. Uh, so that document has been, uh, has been widely distributed both to county staff, MPO, and FDOT. So they're well aware of where we're moving towards. Um, FDOT has been quite progressive over the, the past several years in, in terms of their changing the way that they do planning. And they realize um, that supporting places like Punta Gorda um, enhances the functionality of the network by allowing there to be a point uh, for people to go to, not just continuous places for people to drive through. Thank you. Good, thanks. Hello, I'm uh, John Ludden. I live in the historic district uh, here in Punta Gorda. Built my house just about four years ago, worked with Mitchell on that project. It was very helpful. Uh, but uh, in terms of the walkability of the city, I want everyone to bear in mind that all the residents of the historic district sometimes take their lives in their hands walking down our neighborhood. Uh, you know, a vehicle came crashing through uh, the fence of my own property uh, just over a year ago, nearly hitting the person I love uh, as well as my pet. So having a, a, a you know, one-way traffic down there uh, can get considerably dangerous. Um, I know that Mitchell's uh, looking out of his uh, office window downtown. There are constant accidents down on Marion Avenue. So I think it's a question of health and safety. So I'm really excited about the plan that you've rolled out. And also in terms of the images of the different housing uh, types that you've got, I'm a realtor uh, here. Um, I, I commend you on uh, you know, thinking outside the box and helping us grow uh, as a town. I'm very excited about your plan and I applaud you uh, with your tremendous work. Thank you. Ahead, Hi, I'm Rich Bevac. I live in BSI and uh, enjoyed your presentation. I do have one question. Uh, in the next 10 years, what is going to be the growth and population of, uh, of Punta Gorda? Um, because as the other gentleman said, we don't want enables, but what will the growth be population-wise with all your projections? Uh, so the, the city of Punta Gorda has a comprehensive plan as required by state statute and in that plan we have population projections. Um, the county also has population projections for the entire county. So we know that the growth rate in our area is a little bit more than 1%, 1.3, 1.6, somewhere in that range um, over a five or ten year window. So that's the population that's coming to Charlotte County over the next 10 years is 1.3 times 10. Um, it's really a question of where that growth goes. If the growth goes into the hinterlands of Charlotte County scattered about, um, we're going to see more cars because that's the only way the people that live in those houses are going to be able to get to wherever they want to go, workshop, play, recreate, church. Um, if some of those people can choose to live closer to the city, then we may see less traffic with the same amount of growth. Um, so that's really where we're at with population growth. We don't anticipate that this plan would attract more people to Charlotte County necessarily. It just may attract more people to the city instead of the unincorporated county. Thanks, Mitchell. Nancy? Okay, uh, Nancy Johnson, Team Punta Gorda. Uh, first, I want to thank you for a really uh, wonderful document filled with exciting ideas. Obviously, 
no community is going to adopt everything in there. There are things people will love, there are things people will hate, things that are feasible, things that are not. But you've given us a lot to think about. My question for you is, um, what are some of the lessons learned from other communities around the next steps? How did they go about prioritizing and selecting the things that they wanted to implement? What was the process like? You mind if I start? Yeah. And you can, you can add to whatever I would say. Nancy, that's a great question, and I'm glad you asked. The, first of all, um, when it comes to things like the housing types, mm -hmm. what part of the population growth you were able to direct toward the places where it's helpful, as opposed to letting it ooze onto the locations where it's unhelpful? Uh, that will depend on what you allow. So one of the first priorities is to make sure that your land development regulations permit the right thing with as easy a path to a permit as possible, while adding all the friction and difficulty and restraint that you want for the wrong thing. And that means you have to, as a community, make, decide this is good and that is bad. And we are going to ardently promote good with the rules. And so um, you have to, the way it works with real estate developers, you asked about lessons learned. The real estate developers, uh, despite what you may have heard, are allergic to long drawn out risky public processes. Mm -hmm. Now I know you've met some of the ones who seem to never give up and keep and what have you dragged out. But the, in reality, what usually happens is that uh, a developer will arrive in the office of the architects or the urban designers, the landscape architects, and they'll say, let's design the best thing you've ever done, the perfect, most beautiful, most functional community, um, that would be state of the art and fix all of these great objectives, including the economic ones, but also the environmental and social and cultural ones. Let's do that. But no public hearings, no rezonings, no waivers, no special exceptions, no extra conditions, no, and then they'll run through the list. And, you have, and often you have to turn to such a developer and say, I wish we could do it without doing all those things, but we can't. Because in municipality X or municipality Y, the rules are set up to make it easy to do the wrong thing and make it difficult to do something that makes the community better rather than worse. So if you can make yourself, unlike municipality X or municipality Y, one of those locations that has the right rules and can ardently promote them to the developers that want to do the right things, that's the first thing to do. It, it sounds like paperwork, right? Working on the rule book. But compared to uh, rebuilding seawalls, which you do a lot of every year, or, um, or fixing broken sewer lines, or building new streets, it's really, really inexpensive to work on your zoning. And that, so that's at the top of our list of suggestions. Get the rules right. Now, some effort was made on that regard, particularly to rein in the things that you don't want in the past. That's been done. Uh, being strategic about how to let out a little rain to, and flexibility to encourage the stuff you do want so that you can get some of the advantages of growth without the disadvantages. That's a little harder, but worth the effort. So I would start with that. When it comes to infrastructure, it's very similar. People use the infrastructure you build. If you build eight lane highways and great separated interchanges and giant parking lots and buildings one story tall sitting way at the back of those parking lots, then everybody is going to drive everywhere, every time, for everything. So all of your effort, infrastructure-wise, if you follow that model, to facilitate happy motoring is, you know, to allow to plan around cars and traffic is just going to bring more cars and more traffic. So that lesson should be learned by now in Florida, right? On the other hand, if you build the kind of places that encourage short trips, even if you're using a car, because the streets are interconnected, and you don't have to go around you know, the Arctic Circle to get back and go where you were really headed, which the one-way streets are a problem creating that, then, then people will use those, and including if you put trees over your sidewalks, you will see more people walking along them during the 10 months of the year when it's very easy to do that, uh, when your population is at its biggest. Same thing with bikes. If you never provide a, a bike facilities, don't stand back and be surprised that not nearly a, as many people are, are biking around town as you wish. 
you've got to actually build the infrastructure you want them to use. So those are my two big lessons. Fix the rules, and people use the infrastructure you build. So build the stuff that makes for people and places, not just more cars and more traffic. Thank you. I can add to that just briefly. Um, just to add on to what Victor said, when you fix the rules first and allow certain things to happen that aren't, currently aren't happening, it's like some of the missing middle housing we've, we've shown, um, all of that new development, uh, there's a value capture that happens. So once that has fixed, you start to see more revenues come in. There's also impact fees. You can do community, you can institute a community benefits program like we've suggested, or a density bonus in exchange for certain things. So all of this new development actually becomes the mechanism with which to then start to fund some different projects. But in terms of prioritizing what projects happen first that should happen um, in part with what the community feels most passionate about, so that's something we'd like to hear as part of the feedback. Of all those actions we've listed, there's probably some that will begin to rise to the top as a result of your comments, so, yeah. Could you, uh, Rob Fulmire, uh, Punta Gorda, 20-something years, I moved up north to Punta Gorda from down south. Um, could you put up, uh, could you put up any any of your maps, just any one of them? I don't care. It could be of, sure. of Punta Gorda. Just any one. You have hundreds of them in there. I know. Maybe thousands. There you go. Oh, sorry. Thought you could see it. Never mind. Okay, so we're on the left. If you, this isn't one of the better ones that you have to illustrate the point I'm trying to make, but there is a physical legal Punta Gorda, and then there's a logical Punta Gorda. Right. Punta Gorda as a state of mind, as no, opposed to well, a municipal boundary. It's a state of being, actually. Um, I think that's one of the problems that we have to wrap our arms around, is that that is a, if we want Punta Gorda to be some way, we can't just do it to the legal part of Punta Gorda. We've got this big community, the 80, uh, the 90, 20 rule. There's a lot of commercial development in Punta Gorda, but it's not in Punta Gorda. There's uh, a lot of development that goes on in Punta Gorda, but it's not in Punta Gorda. The elephant in the room is that we're just a crazy gerrymandered, thing, and as you drive up 41, you can go in and out of Punta Gorda multiple times. So the thing I was hoping you guys would address, because I know the council's been a little difficult to think about this, because it's a big problem, to really figure out how we're going to take that whole thing and make it Punta Gorda, and what that costs, what it looks like. We did it in Isla Mirada, that's where I moved from, we did it. We looked at how Duval did it. We looked how Fort, uh, how Fort Myers Beach did it. We looked at Pembroke Pines. And we saw how you can take a mess and get it kind of all in a controlled thing without break and actually make money off of it. Because we got paid big money from the state to form the city of Isla Mirada. They paid us to do it, basically. They bought us a park. They paid for roads. They bought us a police department. They did everything. So that to me is kind of the issue. If we get just the city of Punta Gorda straightened out and then the county comes along and throws a monkey wrench at us, which or just doesn't do anything, then a lot of what we're doing doesn't really work out. So that to me is the elephant in the room is how big, how much of that can we get our hands on? And the plan is really for the area not just for what is legally Punta Gorda. Morning. Um, Sir, could you give us your my, name? My name is Ed Wiener. Uh, I, I, I'm not a bright guy, so I, I'm, I'm probably going to get this wrong. On page uh, 63 of your book, The Big Ideas, I sat through the first charrette 
uh, where we were all around round tables and uh, we discussed what Punta Gorda should look like and taste like and feel like and everything else. And th the common theme was we need to build the economy of Punta Gorda because we're probably going to be spending more um, than we're taking in if we keep going the way we're going. Um, I sat through a council meeting this morning where um, there was plus $20 million thrown on the table in five projects that have to be taken care of or should be taken care of in the next X number of months. I have no idea where that $20 million is coming from, and I'm not sure staff or elected officials uh, know either. Um, okay, back to page 63. It strikes me as number five, encourage strategic commercial development should be number one. If we're going to build Punta Gorda, whether we build it in housing or um, commercial or retail or what have you, somehow we have to allocate enough area, either surface or multi-story, for a commercial project or commercial projects that bring funds into the, into the city. Um, be it, I hate to use this name, but be, the, be it the headquarters for Morgan & Morgan or DHL or somebody or some people, um, those are the contributing factors that we're going to have pumping into the economy. Um, multiple housing, as, and, and I'm a retired architect and planner, I, I've done so many mixed-use projects, I, 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 can't, I can't stand it, but uh, it, residential doesn't give you anything into your economy, be it an apartment on the fifth floor or an apartment on the first floor or a 10,000 square foot house. It's your commercial that's going to be pumping into your community and it's your business that's going to be pumping into the community and your office and your, and your, your, your corporate bases that want to move here after they see what we have to offer. Um, after you move number five to number one, I would make number one, number two, number two, number four, and number three, number four, number three. And if I haven't, yeah, I, if I haven't screwed that up, I hope somebody was taking notes. <laughs> yes, okay. thank, thank you very you. much. <laughs> Looks like we have one more. Go ahead, sir. My name is Adam Cummings. Uh, I've lived here about 30 years. And uh, one of the things I haven't, and I just wanted to kind of offer the comment that one of the things I haven't heard is the path that we're currently on. I'm glad that we're talking about the path that can be. Um, but I want, what I think sometimes doesn't come into the conversation, when I moved here, this is a big town for me. I graduated in the top 10 of my class. There were six of us, okay? So, you know. I like the size of Punta Gorda, and if I could keep it just like it is, I think it's darn near perfect. But there is already sufficient development platted in Charlotte County right now today with, without any new, and what you're talking about is not new, it's different, shifting where that development occurs. So, but without platting any new development at all, if we do nothing and wait, you have a population in Little Charlotte County larger than the current population of Tampa, over half a million people. The most expensive option that we have in terms of dollars, hydrocarbons into the air, deaths from accidents, the list goes on and on, is doing nothing at all. $1,994, the cost of doing nothing in Charlotte County between now and build out was $14 billion in 1994 dollars using the exact strategies that you've described here, you could reduce that $14 billion to $6 billion. That's just the transportation impacts alone. You could also reduce right-of-way acquisition by eminent domain by a factor of four. And it's a 3% develop, not 50% develop. So instead of taking homes away from 60 people, you take them away from one, 
where it was necessary to make changes. Uh, these types of things, not only is it cheaper, does it, it also produces a higher quality of life. Where we, uh, when we're bringing somebody into the community for economic development, we don't take them into US 41 in Port Charlotte. We bring them to downtown Punta Gorda, show them around, wine them and dine them, run them out to the beach to Englewood as quickly as we can, show them the beach, turn around, get them back to Punta Gorda as fast as we can, and then get them into the airport and get them out of here. <laughs> you know, why? Because this is where the quality of life is. This is the place that people want to be. And you're absolutely right, the best thing that we can do to diversify our economy is to protect and improve our own quality of life. And before somebody tells me, that these bicycle pedestrian facilities won't get used. I live behind the library. My office, I have an Edward Jones office right downtown on the corner of Olympia and Sullivan. I bicycle every day to work dressed just as I am now. And it's 7.30 in the morning. I'm fine by the time I get there. Why? Because I'm riding down the linear path that has shade on it. I actually make a longer trip just because it's a nicer ride and it's a safer place to get through. I do it every day, summer, winter, doesn't matter. It does get used, and you'll go out of your way to use it when it's a pleasant, lower stress place to be. I love the projects that we're doing around the community. I love the idea of the additional uh, linear parks. I'm happy to pay for it in terms of taxes and so forth, because I know that if we do nothing, we have the land is laid out as an inventory of residential single family platted lots with insufficient parks, insufficient commercial, insufficient industrial, insufficient everything in the city and out in the county as well. And all of those things have to come in together. He, the gentleman earlier is right. We need to do more annexation to get a more comprehensive approach to all of this. But this is a positive direction. I know when you adopt the plan, that's not the end of it. That's just the beginning. This is a concept, this is a direction we'd like to go. If we don't follow it up with all of the other steps, nothing's gonna happen at all. So thank you for the effort, and I appreciate all the time that's gone into taking the earlier public input and gradually bringing this through the process. I look forward to seeing more. End of sermon, thank you for giving me a couple minutes. Thank you, thank thank you, you sir. And thank you all who have taken time out of your evening to participate in this process along the way. It doesn't end here. We heard from only a, a handful of people really up at the microphone. We understand that not everybody's comfortable sharing in that public forum, but we need your input in other ways. So if you go to the Punta Gorda Master Plan or go to the city's website, you can see the entire plan there and you can provide feedback that goes into an online form that is then shared with our consultants and it'll be shared with our city council members so that everyone's voice is heard. Thank you again for coming out tonight and have a wonderful evening. Thank you.